Welcome to Following On County Cricketer with me, Steve Harmison. Alongside me is Nick Friend, George Dubell from The Cricketer Magazine. You're listening or you're watching on TalkSport 2's Following On podcast or my own YouTube channel or on The Cricketer Magazine's website. Focus switch to, from the Red Bull game to the White Bull game. I think the Red Bull has been fantastic. Start of the summer, good flat pitches, lots of runs scored. And that bodes well for when the white ball comes into fruition and the vitality blast. But what hasn't changed is all the talking points, all the discussion, where you can listen to it. It's here. You know, we'll give you all the best you know, information and knowledge we possibly can about the vitality blast. Get your questions in. Myself, George, Nick, John next week, when he's back, we'll answer them to the best of our knowledge. And if we don't get to them during the show, we'll definitely get them at the mailbag at the end, and the best questions will be read out and answered the best of our ability. So let's get on with the show. So I suppose the start of the show must be the top line, gentlemen. Um, blast, not being on TV, slow ticket sales at Lords, talk of players coming out of retirement. Nick Friend apparently has torn his hamstring. Um, what is the top line from from the week? Nick, you go first. I've had a go there. The top line. <laughs> I probably won't go with my own leg, that's for sure. Um, uh, I think you probably nailed them. I'd chuck in one more, I guess, that sort of goes across the blast and, and those ticket and test ticket sales. I think blast ticket sales have been down. Have been, I don't know if they've necessarily been down, but they've certainly been difficult or more difficult to sell than in the past I think we touched on this last week didn't we um, uh, I think all those things and obviously on top of that the fact that we've got a test match starting Thursday and um, I guess there is some excitement around that new era and all that um, new captain new coach fairly similar squads a couple of deputants potentially um, or one deputant potentially um, but no I think you've you probably covered most of them I mean within the blast itself there have been some interesting lines haven't there I mean I don't think Middlesex is an unlikely, you'd say, based on their previous history, unlikely early early three from three um, starters, but um, but also some very strong teams, which is I think what we we, we touched on very briefly last time round. But um, but yeah, I guess we get get to that a bit later in the show as well, won't we? George, slow ticket sales at Lords, MCC or ECB or whoever said Jubilee weekend, do you buy it? I think that quite a lot of different things have conspired to make it very difficult for them. Uh, you know, England not winning very much. The cost of living crisis that's a, that is massive. Talk of the um, a tube strike. Um, all sorts of things. But ultimately, I think ticket prices have got out of control. And that's what you hear again and again from spectators. And while authorities are saying different things, they probably should listen to the spectators who aren't buying the tickets. The, the ticket sales aren't catastrophic, you should say. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to exaggerate. I think they're like a thousand short for the first day, and it is the biggest ground, uh, cricket ground in England and Wales. So you know, you know, it might, there still will be thirty odd thousand people there. But it is Lords, and they did think, I think, that they were recession proof, and it's a bit of a wake up call. So I hope that they, uh, uh, this is a moment when they realise that um, they've got to be more careful and more inclusive. Mm -hmm. Because actually, even if they had sold it out, even if they had continued to rely on that sort of demographic, which we've seen there in recent years, that's still a mistake. We've still got to make the sport so much more inclusive. Uh, so I hope this is, this is a moment. I, I just fear that they'll use it as a moment to justify the birth of the 100. And they'll say, see, see, Test cricket is losing popularity. Um, and and that's what, that is what will happen, to be honest, because people will use the data to back the argument that they already had. It was quite galling, having been at Lords only a few weeks ago, to see 2,000 free tickets turned out to school children on a Thursday. I know it's half term, but um, it feels so galling to. And I know, as I know, it's, you know, you're not, certainly not charging 160 quid for the Cardiff Championship, but um, but either way, it's so galling to see how easy it easily it can be done. To, to get people in, to get new people in, um, and then to see that not done when, you know, on the biggest stage, when, when, when ultimately that biggest stage is really what you're trying to, you know, make more accessible to people, isn't it? If you can, if you can give people access to a Lord's Test match for the first time in their lives at, at an affordable price, I mean, you, you, open, you open doors, don't you? Whereas, as George says, this, this feels very much like 
the opposite of doing that. You, you know, there's a funny yeah. thing as well that I, I actually think that cricket has become, in a way, better to watch on TV than at the ground. You know, at the ground, you can be too hot, you can be too cold, you can be sunburned, you can be rained upon. You can be you miles can away. fortune if you want a cup of tea rather than just going to your kitchen. And some of the insight on TV is absolutely fantastic. You know, the, the coverage, the, the camera angles, all that stuff. It is brilliant. And it's almost got to the stage where it's working against the game in a funny way. Uh, and the other thing about the coverage, of course, that that's behind a paywall too, or nearly all of it is. Uh, we've just made our game a little bit exclusive. And uh, I hope that, you know, good comes of this and that this is a moment where everyone realises that. Yeah, and I, I, I look at this... I look at the when I seen the ticket prices and I seen you know, all the noise that's coming with it, whether it was one thousand seats or five thousand or ten thousand seats that were going to be empty. I was hoping I'm from the northeast of England. I had a, many great sort of debates with Matt Pryor in the winter talking about you know, how inclusive our game is not when it comes to the cost of the way junior cricket set up, because you know if you've got two or three kids in county representative system you know you're, you're paying a, a few quid to get them you know little little johnny from monday to friday's coaching to then the kit to the weekend and everything that goes with that um and you're right spot on about the the way the coverage is on the tv you know sky of do an unbelievable job you know listening to the likes of nasa and others and rob key when he was on ian ward now going to be mark butcher um they do and it's it, and sometimes you don't you can't get distracted when you're sitting in your own house but again like you said, it's on TV. Just something else that's come into this um, the TV debate. We'll go into the blast in a second, but we're hearing rumours that Owen Morgan and, and Joffrey Archer are going to be part of you know, the TV TV commentary uh, crew. Where do you sit on that one? Because yeah, what are you going to get out of Morgan and Archer? They're talking about a lot of friends in that dressing room. England have a completely shocker like they have been in the last sort of 18 months, two years. Is Joffrey Archer really going to have a go at Jimmy Anderson? Is Owen Morgan really going to have a go at Ben Stokes or Joe uh, Joe Root? Um, I think there's. Be Harmy, you'll know better. You'll know better than us. As I mean, as a as a broadcaster yourself. I mean, there's. It feels to me like there are different roles within that commentary team, and, and also knowing the standards that Sky set as well, they won't be bringing guys in just to have a name on commentary. I don't think. I mean, I I would I would guess the role is to do what Stuart Board has done when he's stepped in and to offer us you know the, the the most valuable insight there is I guess which is the insight from being in that dressing room and knowing that team and knowing those guys better than even you know dare I say Nasser and, and Athos are likely to I mean um, I, I'd, I'd be surprised if they have a go at their teammates <laughs> if that's the question but um, but I guess there is it but there is a I do I do still think there's a role for that kind of insight I think Monday Night Football have done it very well haven't they when they get um Current pros alongside Carragher and Neville for the evening. That, that that's you're not expecting them to to launch into tirades against against their mates. But but what they can do is tell you the stuff that, for all the analysis in the world, you possibly can't quite understand if you're not in that dressing room. If you've not been part of the one winning seventeen, um, obviously Morgan last played Test cricket in that very good English team, England team, didn't he? Back in 11, 12, 13 kind of thing. But um, but yeah, I don't know. And I, I think it's just interesting, also on a human level, just to hear from guys outside of that environment of post-match interview which is really what we get most of the time with with certainly a captain like Morgan and a, and a fast bowl like Archer I don't know on, if that's fair. on having a, a former uh, having current players in there I, I agree that the insight that they can give is it's the feel element for me is is what these players feel when the big moments yeah and obviously Morgan's been such a huge figure in the development of English cricket in the last few years that you would think that uh, he would certainly be very much worth listening to. I've no idea what Joffre will be like, but no doubt he'll learn from it. It might be something he, you know, has to think about as part of his future as well. So that that seems good. I mean, it it's not as black and white, is it? As uh, you, you just sit there and slag people off. <laughs> you know, we're talking to Stuart Broad, who did media today, and he is exceptional. I mean, it is, I, I think he's as good as anyone's ever been at doing it. And um, he's just very interested. He, he offers a lot of insight. Um, and he'll be self-critical and stuff. I mean, you don't have to be that critical of the people you play with. I do think there's a balance, uh, and I do think there are times when, um, you know, it can be hard for broadcasters, not so much Sky, because I think, you know, you'd have to say that NASA has been incredibly straight over the last few years. He's been fantastic. 
Uh, but but there are times, actually, I think the BBC have probably been more guilty of this than Sky, when, um, and not just about cricket, when, when the coverage can just be bland and it can be sound bites and it can just be, you know, celebrities who are, who are wheeled out to talk fluff. That is definitely best avoided, but I, I, that's not really what they've done. They've been quite good with the people they've chosen. Mm. Uh, to do cricket in recent years and um, you know if they're not very good the market will be will speak won't it and, and, they, and they won't get that many more opportunities so you know good luck to them and uh, it'll you know, be really interesting to see how, how they go and, and what they say yeah I agree I totally agree and I hope that it does go well because listening to a World, Ki- winning, World Cup winning captain um, and the insight that he gives um, I think will be will be fascinating and hopefully en- en- enhance the, the spectator's view on, on TV um, right we go moments of the week moments of the week well I think the moment of the week has to be the Yorkshire Lancashire game at Old Trafford sold out T20 blast, you know, not a great deal of, of blast cricket on TV, which is being questioned. Um, what have you made? Uh, what did you make of that game, gentlemen? And you know, first of all, what are you made of the non-showing of you know live cricket on TV from the Vitality Blast? I, I thought some of the games that have been on have been odd. Uh, um, am I right in thinking it was um, Leicestershire and Derbyshire on Saturday afternoon? It was one of the yeah. first two games shown. That strikes me as an odd choice. Um, look, I still think, I still think they want it to fail. I do. I genuinely think they want it to fail. So uh, there, there's so much great cricket out there, but those are not two massively supported teams. Uh, I mean, I watched it. You know, I am a proper geek, uh, and and it was still interesting. But I don't think that was a game that makes sense to me to pick if you're trying to sort of kickstart the blast season and gain some sort of traction in the in the marketplace if, if you like I, I think that was really really odd um, you, you know to, to be fair to Sky there's a test match about to start they'll have committed huge amounts of resources to that uh, one of the things that I've learned traveling the world and listening to other broadcasters is how good they are compared to competitors and there's no comparison so I don't want to be just uh, criticizing Sky but I do think there's an agenda when it comes to the 100 in particular, and um, I, I find that a bit tiresome. But there, there was really good cricket there in that game. Uh, I think I'm right in saying Gleeson played a huge role in that game, bowling sharp, yeah? Uh, that's uh, a couple of, I think it's five for a couple of days later, wasn't it? The Worcester, yeah. they went over Worcestershire rather than the rest. Yeah, but he bowled, he bowled sharp yeah, at the sorry, end of that sorry, game sorry. too, yeah. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, and, um, a big moment, he held his nerve. He got Brooke, yeah. A big moment, he, he, he held his nerve and he, he managed to get Brooke, which I think if Brooke had got that ball at any other time in that game, I think it might have been a different result. Um, but I was just, uh, for all the questions that have come from the, the thing that encouraged me about the blast, um, because it's obviously it's had its doubt as it's got its knockers, and whether there is an agenda against it, I was just. The Yorkshire, the Roses game is one of the best, for me, it's one of the best in the world. Um, and it, it didn't disappoint the game with you know, the crowd participation. There was, there was quite an irony. I thought one of the most, probably the most eye catching result actually was a couple of days later when, when Yorkshire, when Yorkshire beaten by Leicestershire, ironically, who, um, mm. who hadn't started very well, who have done a lot of sort of fairly public soul searching the last couple of weeks. I think Paul Nixon spoken pretty honestly. Callum Parkinson was pretty honest after one of their defeats, the Blast. But, um, I mean, you look man for man at those top sevens. I mean, Yorkshire's top seven of, what is it, Lyde, Milan, Kola Cadmore, Brooke, Roots, Shadab Khan, Jordan Thompson. I think Matt Revis in there. But then you've got Don Bess, Adil Rashid, Harris Ralph. And that is, that is, you know, an outrageously strong blast side, isn't it, you'd have to say. And for them to come up, what, 30-odd runs short, was it, against against Leicester, was, um, yeah, I guess a real turn-up, wasn't it? But um it was. It was a fantastic result for the tournament, that. I, I mean, obviously, mm. unfortunate for Yorkshire, but they're good enough to bounce back, as you say. But Leicestershire looked miles off the pace yeah. Yeah. in previous games. So it's such a, that's a really brilliant win for them. And, and, and you know, hopefully that they, they done can... That. You know, ha- had they been three from three, you know, you begin to worry mm. that the tournament slipped away from them already. And it's such an important tournament for Leicestershire. So, yeah, really heartening for any, anybody yeah. but a Yorkshire supporter. And I, I think they feel right. They've done it before as well, haven't they? It was it twenty twenty? I think they, I'm think I'm right in saying that they, they, they were the only team to beat Notts in two thousand twenty. They beat them in the group stage and they nearly beat them in the quarter final, but they lost on that. What was it? Was it higher power play score in the end? 
So, Paul Nixon's. I mean, they've obviously they've won the blast more than anyone else, haven't they, Leicester? But, um, well, but which was the game, Nick? Which was the game, Nick? Well, I mean, it's unfair to <laughs> mention him, but Aaron Lilly had an absolute shocker at the end. Do you remember? Yeah, that was the that was the uh, the the higher power play score. So, Lilly and oh, I think it was Dieter Klein both misfielded with a couple of balls to go, didn't they? Would, yeah. But they did that. They were that close to finals day in 2020, and so they've always been competitive. They've always, I don't know. And, been more than some of their parts, perhaps. If you look, if you look at them versus a, you know an eleven like Yorkshire's there, um, and as I said, they've always been successful in this competition. Obviously, Paul Nixon won it a fair few times as a player as well. So, um, no, as you say, good on them for getting over the line on Sunday because that, on the back of the Saturday result, could have been quite a bleak occasion. <laughs> and, and actually, Derbyshire really nearly beat uh, Birmingham as well um, with three or four balls to go. I thought they were ahead. So, so there are all sorts of possible um, shocks, if that's a shock been... in store, and, and that's really, really entertaining. I mean, I, th- I love the fact that there are more than eight or ten teams, and you know, we're talking about Leicester and Derbyshire. It's been, it's uh, been quite we... good to see how many teams have lost games, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think there are five unbeaten, or six unbeaten, but I think Surrey have only played once. Um, it's been good to see teams beating other teams, and it's been good to see teams that as I mentioned Middlesex at the top of the show they've been shocking in this competition for years but I think they got to the quarters in 2019 uh, but otherwise since 2008 when they won it they've hardly got anywhere so for them to be three from three um, playing some very good cricket with a pretty young side has been impressive to see Paul Sterling doing what he does has been great um, and obviously sorry I mean I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the Oval tonight to see their second game but the but, you know the 15 man squad they can put out is 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 quite something isn't it for um I mean, the four guys who miss out, I, I dare say, would find themselves in most other sides of the competition. Yeah, well, you mentioned before the Yorkshire side, but I think the Surrey side would give it a good run for money. And I think when we talked about yeah. the championship at the start, we backed Surrey because on paper, 1-11, to 11, I believe they're a, a, a better side mm-hmm. than than Hampshire. But some of the, the sort of the talking points, there's been some great highlights so far, I think, in in the blast and just got in front of me here when you see you know, Harry Brooks start for, for Yorkshire. He got 60 on a, sixty in the first night of 27 balls to get you know, over the line against um, Worcestershire. And if you have any of these games, uh, another one, a highlight from a Durham point of view um, on, on night two, Coglin, Paul Coglin got 40 off 30 balls and then went and got four for 15 against Leicester. Um, and Leicester, like you said, looked miles away, then all of a sudden went and beat Yorkshire. So I think that's been the story of this T20 blast so far, that there's been some massive scores. Second night again, Birmingham, you know, 207, mm. put off 16 overs, Paul Sterling had 119 off 50, 51 balls. It's definitely a batsman's game and not a bowler's game. I was, uh, I was at Radlett for es- Stephen Eskenazi, 80, 87 off 37. If there's, if there's a better player... If there is a better player in the blast without a hundred deal, then I have not seen him. Second top run scorer in the comp in 2020, eighth last year, skippering this year, starting with a bang. Um, someone give him a contract. <laughs> oh, that's, oh, on that, I did hear. I did hear. This is. I, I hope this is of interest. There's a guy who's playing for Worcestershire second eleven at the moment. Cash, part Cash of the Valley. Saka. Cash yeah. Valley, yeah. Who, who might terrific. just get a hundred deal. He might get picked up by Birmingham, I think it would probably be, and um, it would sort of bypass county cricket. It would be quite interesting, wouldn't it? Probably yeah, freelancer. Doesn't, doesn't happen that, that often, and that comes back to my point, and it's a bit the conversation I had with Mark Butcher, and you know, it was probably Butcher's point more than, than my point, I'm maybe nicking it off him. This 100 and the blast, where does it sort of figure in sort of cohesions with each other? And the, for me, the, the auction, the English players' auction, should always come after the blast. Because, like you mentioned, there's, there's somebody got a deal in the 100 who is going to have a shocking blast. Where if you had the blast deal afterwards, the auction afterwards, you had a chance of, of, of giving a young player a chance to, to, to earn a few quid and reward him from having you know, a very, very good blast season and then he slips into the 100. You're not going to pick your England players because your England players are going to be allocated to these big, you know, the, the, the big, bigger teams. F- overseas players allocated to the bigger teams. But the six other players that go into the auction, the seven other players that go into the auction, surely there's got to be some, you know, some way of having the auction after the blast and then you get the best players going into it who are having a good time. Because at the minute, there might be somebody in the blast going, I don't know, 
I'm not bothered about the blast. I've got a 50 grand contract in the 100. You wouldn't. But there's limited. Uh, there is some ability to do that, isn't there? I mean, the, yeah. the, the, the wild cards, yeah? Uh, um, so I, I don't know how many spaces there are for that this season. Nick will, will know. There are, well, there's a wild card each, and there, there are eight wild cards. And then I think, I think what people will be. What will affect it more than last year is there'll be far fewer replacements this year, won't there? Because last year there were COVID replacements left, right, and centre. So this year, so I think by the end of the hundred last year, most guys who'd say there were very few guys who'd have said merit the deal, but didn't have one, and there were probably more guys who were quite left field who ended up with a deal because because teams were losing three players on a night after testing positive, and then three guys were having to drive out of a Royal London game and meet up with their. I think was it. I think it was Matt Milnes who was on the way out of a out of Royal London game, or drove straight from a Royal London game to to his hundred team, having just found out he had a hundred deal as a replacement. I think that's right. Um, yeah, well, Chris Benjamin so, had a net, didn't he? Yeah, Chris exactly. So, had so, a net and got signed up. I think I think the gist though is that, that that will happen far less this year because because obviously where we are with COVID, so effectively it's eight spots then plus injury replacements, and if there are left fielding replacements that come from guys outside of those allocated positions I assume as well um, so but it's, it's interesting isn't it I mean the I think I think it's hard to say you could blame players if if they weren't playing anything playing for anything with a couple of blast games to go and they were worried about their bodies let's say um, you know you just got to be pragmatic haven't you the money on offer for a you know you talk you hear what the guy you, know, you hear the guys who had 100 deals but then lost them when the when the competition was postponed in 2020 you know that for some guys that was 50 60 grand wasn't it that, that they had and they didn't have so you couldn't blame guys having been given those contracts if they if a bit of their mind come mid July was you know was was on it um much as we probably don't want to hear that that's i guess purely from a you know fragility you know athlete fragility perspective is probably just the way it works isn't it over the weekend there was some yeah, some. I thought Friday night's program was very, very good. It was like eight matches, some some big winners. Um, Luke Fletcher five for thirty-two for knots. Chris Lynn eighty-three off forty-six balls. Um, in the same game, Ben Curran a huge hundred nod run partnership um, against against Durham. Phil Salt got a fifty. Cad Morton broke in the the Roses match. You mentioned Chris Benjamin. 43 off 18 balls at the end of the innings against Derbyshire to win by three runs. Fantastic innings that was. Um, Bracey 70 off 45 balls. Nick, you'd be happy with that one. Ollie Pope batting at three for the first time, I think, in, in any sort of cricket. Um, 62 off 46. Um, and it carried on. Tim Davy. We've got a, a question about Tim David a bit later on. 60 off 25 balls in a, in a game against Worcester for Lancashire. And there was one that was, I noticed that I watched you know, I went back and watched some of the footage of that uh, and I was pleased to see Pat Brown back playing. Um, he got three for 35 in the match and then he had injury, got picked for England a couple of years ago um, and I thought he did quite well and then he obviously got an injury. So young bowler coming back, which was which was good to see. Um, and Chris Benjamin again. Richard Gleeson in that game got five for 30. Um, and Chris Benjamin again against Durham. He got 68 off 38 balls. So they were the standout performances for me in the um, in the blast over the, the course of the weekend is there anything else that you know, Nick George is seeing in the blast I think story wise you think that's been a you know, been a little bit of a standout uh, yeah I think I mean, on, it's sort of on Tim David and it's sort of on we mentioned, the, we mentioned it feels wrong to mention the Roses Clash without just admiring that Lancashire team which does I mean, when you add Josh Butler to it next week as well you're going to have Butler David and Livingston the same, Butler David Livingston and Salt in the same top five um, and that is Probably, I think I, I can't remember who it was. It might be Matt Roller. I think he, he described it as probably the most powerful top five or top order we've ever seen in the blast. Which you'd you do well to disagree with. I think well, that's going to be it's going to make for some extraordinary viewing. Um, I've enjoyed watching Somerset so far with Banton, Smeeds, Russo in that top three or four. Fair played Somerset as well because they had Peter Siddle and Marshall Delanga set up as their overseas players. I think and I think Rudy, Russo was quite a late addition. Um, He's one of the better franchise batters going around, isn't he? And has been for well. A long it's time. really interesting that signing because I think that a lot of Somerset supporters, I am one, uh, were underwhelmed by that. Yeah, and that's... he—I mean, it's early days, but he has been terrific. He's, he's been just a very good fantastic. player, isn't he? <laughs> he's a very good player, but he's—he's been—he's batted fast, but he's also been smart. 
because yes. what they have in that top order is a lot of explosion, but they're very, very young. They're very excited. They're very young, and uh, he's uh, he has started absolutely perfectly. I mean, what are they? Mm. They're three from three as well, aren't they? In fact, I think they're yeah. above middle six on run rate. They are. They are. Yeah. So, so they've they've started absolutely fantastically. And still, uh, and uh, Delang has actually taken wickets, hasn't he? Which he did in the hundred as well. Um, yeah. So. You know, I, I, I would still worry a little bit about their bowling. I suspect there'll be a night or two when they, they have a tough time. But that batting light up, that is dangerous. I think I saw, um, I saw, I saw last, when they beat Essex, I believe they were donating £50 a six to Sporting Minds, the, um, the young athletes charity, for which Will Smead is an ambassador, I believe. And he went out there and hit six, <laughs> hit six sixes and raised three hundred quid in his own. So, um, if you want to, if you want a job done, do it, do it yourself. He, um, I think they were doing one hundred fifty quid if you hit the ball out the ground as well, which he did too. So, um, no, they they are very watchable. You'd have to say about watchable and the names that were mentioned there: Livingston, Butler. You know, Parkinson's not in there from a Lancashire point of view. Let's go to the race, race to Amsterdam. Race to Amsterdam. Well, the race to Amsterdam, 14 man England squads being picked, ODIs, three ODIs in in Holland. Um, Netherlands play in the West Indies at this moment, live on Talksport 2. Uh, strong squad for me Roy, Salt, Milan, Morgan, Livingston, Butler, Mo and Ali. David Willey, Sam Curran, Adil Rashid, Reese Topley, Bryden Kars, Luke Wood and David Payne. Two uncapped players, five left arm seamers, no Parkinson, but I'm assuming that he possibly could be in and around that third test match squad. Um, I think it's at Headingley. Um, interesting, no Duckett, no Clark, no Banton, no Billings. England only taking 14, which I think is the right choice because you don't want six players just high vision taking drinks everywhere. Um, George, what do you make of this squad? Well, I think you know, some of the uh, the guys who missed out are interesting. I mean, uh, uh, Billings is unlucky, isn't he? And I thought that um, I don't know—is is Vince okay? I would have expected to see him there. Um, so, and yeah, it, it's interesting you mentioned Duck. Sorry, I, I missed you there. He got sorry. He got forty in his last blast game, which was I think Monday night. Which yeah, well, I was wondering because uh, they're about to play at the time we're recording this, and uh, I was interested to see whether he was in the side. So uh, I, I was surprised to see him miss out. Sorry, George, who's that? I miss I, I missed that for a sec. Vince, James Vince, not yeah. in the not in the squad, um, which is an interesting one because he got forty in his last blast game. And obviously, uh, it looked like he had a bit of a breakthrough last summer, didn't it? It was, was it uh, 100 against Pakistan at the Aegeus. I don't know. He's he's obviously a very good player who could play all formats. I think. Uh, I, I I thought that he I, look. I was surprised not to see his name, and I was surprised not to see Bill, Billings. I was pleased to see Wood. I, I think he's a better red ball bowler, but he's he's a a, a really good cricketer. Um, and um, nice to see Cars. Uh, 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 back in there because you would think that he could have a role to play in all formats for England. Yeah, we Bryden Cars. I think he would have been. I tipped Matty Potts at the start of the summer, and the only reason I tipped Matty Potts was because Bryden Cars was injured, and I thought Cars would have been a shoe in for a Test match role at some point this summer because of his pace, his height. I think he nearly qualifies as that number eight batsman as well. So when he played for England last year under Ben Stokes and that group that got sort of pooled together in COVID, I thought he he held himself very very well. He just fortunate to pick an injury up in the uh, in the in the winter. Um, Roy, so far, you know, if we're, if we're looking at numbers, Jason Roy got he's had fifteen one blast game um, against against Glamorgan playing tonight. Um, at, uh, at the Oval. Phil Stolter started well, 59 um, against Yorkshire, 29 against Worcester. David Milan, it was an interesting call, David Milan. Um, I think I think George's probably took James Vince's place. I think, it, is it the experience of Vince or experience of Milan? Um, but I think the way Milan plays in the shorter format of the game, I think he's got the nod. He's at a 33-50 and a five so far. One out in from Owen Morgan. He got 41 of 24 balls against Gloucester. Liam Livingston, well, he's played 
and played the one game so far, 26 with a bat, um, but he bowled his four overs, not for 28 with a ball. Nice to see Sam Curran back playing. Again, another one that's only played the one game, 36, and he got one for good that he bowled his, his one over. Only two wickets in three games for Adil Rashid. Carson Topley have played once each, a game each. Um, and the two uncapped players, I really hope, because he's such a nice lad. We've had him on the Critic Collective on TalkSport 2. And he was in the Caribbean. Didn't get a game. I really hope David Payne gets a game. Because you know, I watched him close up in, in that short trip in the Caribbean. And he worked hard. Um, he was out there. He had a smile on his face. He looked as though he was so appreciative of being you know, in England. In, in talked in, as an England player. So far in the blast. He had two wickets against Middlesex. And three wickets against Surrey. So I hope in the three games that Luke Wood and David Payne get a go. Um, how good is it to see Sam Curran back in England squads? Well, it's fantastic. And, uh, and actually, we've had a reminder this week of how valuable he could be in the test side because, you know, they, they are, they're deciding who's going to bat number eight at Lords, And it looks like it's going to be Jack Leach, which, which actually isn't the wrong decision, I don't think. Uh, you know, he, he shapes up really quite well as a, as a batter these days. But that's a hell of a promotion. Um, and it's just, it's, you know, uh, the other option, I think, was Potts at eight or, or Craig Overton. I think they've got, they're now looking beyond him. So it shows that uh, Sam Curran could play a huge role with, with the bat and the ball. I, I, obviously, there are still doubts about exactly what he can do with the ball. But if he is there as an all-rounder to help the balance the side... You know, you can definitely see how he could have a role. And, and just on a human level, yeah, it's lovely that he's recovering and um, beginning to be able to fulfil his potential again because he's a you know, fantastically talented all-round cricketer. And what have you made, George, of um, possible coming out of retirement for Moan Ali? Potential return for Adil Rashid, both being mentioned. Is that just fantasy land or is it something that I think is... I would love to see Moan come back, but I just don't know how he's going to... Stick a, kill, stick, a, stick a claim to get back into the squad. As much as if Moen tells me he's fit, but if fit and really wants to play, I'd pick him. Well, it's the same thing with Moen. You can see how, if he were at his best, he walks into the England side this week, doesn't he? He balances the side batting at eight, uh, and he can bowl. So, um, I, I think at his best, I still think he's England's best offie. Um, and... Yeah, I hope they do persuade him to play because I think there's unfinished business there. I'll tell you what uh, they have to do with Adil. People forget, but he made his debut as a batter who bowled. I think I did his uh, uh, first-class debut in 2006 at Scarborough, although the memory does play tricks, and I think he replaced Darren Lehman in the Yorkshire side. And he was meant to bat at six, and as it happened, he, I think it was a night watch when he batted seven, and he took a six four or so in the second innings. And obviously, he's now known as a bowler. If Yorkshire wanted to play, ask him to bat six. I bet he does. He loves I, batting. I agree. I, I agree. He, I think he's a fantastic young cricketer. He was a fantastic young cricketer when I first saw him. Um, played against him quite a bit. Managed to play with him quite a bit, with or in and around with him with England and, and briefly at Yorkshire. And his hands are unbelievable. His hands were fantastic, and he he could play. I think I first played against him. He batted at six or seven. And he was a dangerous customer to bowl to because he had these quick hands. He was quite good on the shortcut. That was always you know, how I felt about Adil. And batting at number ten is criminal, but it's a good side um, that the England the England team is. If Goffey could get him to bat number six for Yorkshire, I think it would be a masterstroke. Um, and speaking of another guy who should possibly bat six for Yorkshire um, is in the squad, David Willey, back in the squad, and Nick Five left armers. Is it a case of we're going to Australia. We want one left armour, if not two, in our group. So we're going to take five to Holland, and whoever does the best has got a chance. Uh, first and foremost, I think it's quite fun. <laughs> um, I've never seen it before. I've never seen... No, I've, I've probably seen that. I've never seen one right arm seamer in a 14-man squad before. Um, I think what... Um, I want, Yeah, I do wonder whether... You've got five guys, none of whom you'd say are established, as in, you know, the, or, or as in, sorry, rather the man in possession. I do wonder whether there's a new coach who fancies having a look at all of them and may well make his mind up from there. I mean, um, of course, you, you go back to the T20 stuff and you can add Tim R. Mills into the mix as well. So, 
you, you've effectively got a six strong panel of left arm seamers for for your white ball stuff um, albeit five and fifty over I'd yeah, and then obviously you've got a couple who've got. They, I think I think what what they get away with here is they've all got they all do pretty different things, don't they? Reese Topley is is taller. David Willey swings it. David Payne is taller than Willie and swings it, um, but obviously without Willie's record and without Willie's batting. Um, Sam Curran's a bit more through the crease. Is the best batter of the lot of them, and there are so many of them. I can't remember who the fifth one is. Uh, Luke Wood. Um, Luke Wood is probably the quickest after Topley, isn't he? And a bit skiddier and uh, has a lot of bottle as well, doesn't he? Bowls, bowls at the death a, little, a fair bit. Is fairly useful with the bat at the death as well. So um, and fair play is a reward for a lot of good work. Although quite interestingly, very, hardly any work in fifty over cricket. He's done most of his white ball cricket in, in the in the blast, which I think we'll see more and more of because the best certainly while the schedules as it is. The but to be fair, I don't have a mu- I, I don't take much issue with that because I, I can't think of the last England player. Who was picked to play 50 over cricket on the back of his 50 over cricket anyway? Um, but it's quite interesting that someone like Luke Wood is coming in basically on the back of his T20 form. Um, but yeah, I do wonder whether it's a case of have a look at five and then whittle it down to whoever Matthew Mott wants to take to Australia come the winter. And we can't finish with talking about the, the white ball side with without sort of waxing lyrical about Josh Butler, not only in the IPL. But after, obviously, what happened with him in, in the winter, being left out of, of the West Indies group, do you see any return because of how good he is in white ball cricket to the test side? Or is it, I hope, I really do, and I say this with every good intention, I really do hope that Josh Butler just concentrates now on on, on the white ball game because I, I agree he's with the best that. in the world. Yeah, with I'm with you. I, I, with the, with I, the I, best I, will I, in the I, world. I, it. Just let him be free. It's so wonderful yeah. to see. Uh, you know, he, he is, he's the best England have ever had at doing it. Uh, and it's not as if they haven't tried to make him into a test cricketer, and it makes him look world weary. Uh, I, I'm sure there'll be a temptation to do it. You can understand the temptation to do it. I, I hope that uh, they resist it. I hope he resists it. Uh, I, I would use the data we've seen for the last month or so to come to exactly the opposite conclusion and just say, yeah. Uh, He's proved that uh, freed up from those worries and stresses, he is just a world beater. So let him be that, and let him be the great white ball player that he is, and don't worry about the rest of it. I Agreed. totally agree. I just hope that 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 just stays that way because you know I, I felt not awful because you're doing your job, but I'm sitting there talking about a guy in red ball cricket who has had a real struggle in you know marrying up the side. Everybody wanted to be this Gilchrist, Gilchrist character. It's like Adam Gilchrist never walked out to bat at 120 for five, 80 for five, 90 for five. He never did that. You know, we, we put so much pressure on Josh Butler, I thought. Um, and unfortunately, because of how good he is as a player, you know, he, he brought the brunt of, of some of the criticism that come that way, that, that test side did. But I hope, I really do, for Josh's sake and for everybody else's sake, move on. And let the guy be the best there is at, at white ball cricket. And we talk about in English cricket about how doom and gloom a lot of this stuff is. But we've got the best best red ball player in the world, in my opinion, at this moment in time, in Joe Root. We've got the best white ball player at this moment in time in Josh Butler. And I hope that with you know, with the hands sort of shackles off, captaincy of Joe, he kicks on and scores the same amount of boatload of runs. And Joss doesn't have the shackles back on of Test match cricket hanging over him, and he becomes in Texas to win T20 World Cup in Australia and the, the World Cup and beyond. Because I think the pressure that's off him now, I think it's just shown in the IPL that what a, a fantastic player he is. So that's it. Race to Amsterdam is gone, and fingers crossed that England do well over there. Um, we'll get on to your questions and the mailbag. The mailbag. Right, first question is David at the cricket. Does George know anything about Mo and Ali and Brav's availability for Worcester? They haven't played yet in the blast this year. Well, I think, I think Moen was at the Champions League final, so presuming he's got back from it, presuming he's not still stuck in traffic or anything, yeah, he'll play imminently. 
I don't know about Bravo. I don't know what the deal was. Uh, Nick, Nick might remember. But uh, again, look, and the other thing is, I know they've lost three out of three, but I don't think they were miles away. They've had real tough games too, by the way. Mm-hmm. Lancashire, not Yorkshire, I think. So three sort of test yeah. sides. And they've lost them by, oh, I don't know. They were quite narrow margins. So uh, there's still a bit of hope there, I think. And it's nice to see Haynes doing well. And uh, um, uh, yeah, so I, I, imminent for Moen and Bravo, I'm not quite sure, actually. Uh, Mark well. Fletcher asks to the both of you, um, have, have Sky downgraded the blast over the 100, given the apparent reduced cover uh, coverage this year? Well, I think we've answered that. I don't know if you've got any more to add to it. Well, well yes. I mean, I just I don't want to sort of sit on the fence and be disingenuous with, with people who are asking that question. Yes, I think they have. Uh, but I would cut them quite a lot of slack because I think they're the best broadcasters in the world and um, they are they do put quite a lot into the coverage they show but I do think there's an editorial uh, decision there that uh, they think the 100 is the future and um, I'm not sure it's a level playing field between those two competitions you can like them both you know and one for you Nick <laughs> of Jonathan Ramondi how bloody good is Tim David? <laughs> he is it bloody hard. Um, he really does. He, he properly smokes it, doesn't he? He's, his story is extraordinary, isn't it? Um, l- last year, just like, yeah, the last 12 months, um, from being a slightly left field signing for Surrey's last couple of blast games and then into the Royal London Cup, I believe he was just, I believe he happened to be playing club cricket in the Netherlands at the time. I think he got that story right. And from there, um, I mean, obviously he was playing Big Bash before, but um, you know, never certainly never as the world beater he is now. I mean, Singapore international, I think soon to, soon to be a, soon to be Australia international. Um, one would assume uh, he's done he's done the CPL, he's done the PSL, he's done the IPL. He's um, he's over here for the hundreds. Uh, Southern Brave, I think, got very very fortunate with retention rules and having picked him up quite late on in the um, as a replacement. I think last time around they they were. I think pretty chuffed to be able to keep him for this time. This one, um, he just he just hits it very hard, and he's got very long levers. Um, but I think he's, he's but he's also a better cricketer than someone who just stands there and swings and hits it hard. He's he's obviously yeah fair play to him. It's it's a remarkable story of, and to be honest, it it, it does it, it really. I know that for all the skeptics of the count of the fran- franchise circuit and everything, I mean, it's it's a real it's a real win for for. You know, it really does. It has really shown what can happen if you, if you're a slightly late developer in that sense, and you get on. You know, and you're not necessarily one of the big names, and it does show where you can go in a year's time, doesn't it? Because he'll be earning big money on that circuit for for, for quite some time now. And fair play to him, he's done it. He has taken. He has taken the long way around. Yeah, he really has. It's a lovely story. Uh, it reminds me a bit of the Dirt Nallas story, going go back a sort of yeah. mm. decade or generation even. Uh, but it, it, yeah, it, it, it just shows what can happen, and, and you know, it completely changed uh, Nana's life, didn't it? And um, it's no doubt doing the same for him. You look at all the franchise talk, all the hundred talk, and whether the blast has been downgraded. But I think any hundred side would like Salt at the top, Livingston, David, in the middle. I think that you know, in the blast game is, is <laughs> and then uh, and then Joss and then Joss forever watching. Wherever Joss, and Joss wherever, he, wherever he comes <laughs> back in and fits in, um, hopefully he fits in very, very soon um, at a ground which you're going to be watching soon. George, where are you this week? Obviously, going to be at the Test match. Yeah, I was going to be at the you? Oval. Going to be at the Oval with Nick tonight, but um, I'm doing this instead, and um, I don't think I'll get any more cricket in before the two Tests, which are basically back to back. I was just going to say though, just uh, just quickly, I was going to ask both of you, but Nick in particular, maybe. Uh, who are the players who um, don't have 100 deals, who stick out from the blast at the moment? Because uh, just, just thinking of Worcester there, as because we, we were talking about them. Pat Brown. Know, ben Cox or, or Ed Barnard have. Ed, ba- Ed Barnard would be the one for me. I who think Ed's a terrific cricketer, yeah? Yeah, he's, um, and, he does, and, and he does and he does, a, f- a fair bit of everything as well, which mm. um, part of me wants to say that he's got a contract for this year, but I could have that completely wrong. I'm just trying to simultaneously Google that now. Um, as I say, I could have that completely wrong. Well, he had one um, last year. I thought he didn't this year. He had one originally. Uh, Pat Brown is the one in that Worcester squad for me. He, oh, yeah. He's part of the Birmingham Phoenix squad last year. Pat has had 
Pat Brown's had a really tough old time with injuries, and he's, he's basically missed two years. You know, he didn't play. In, well, he didn't play in last year's blast. He played. He returned and was fit for the hundreds. Um, but I think those three wickets against Lanks were his first wickets in the blast since 2020. And I remember speaking to him after that season for a piece, and he was. He had a really tough old time with his back, and he he basically told me he basically said that he'd been embarrassed with himself the way he got with the way he'd gone and felt like he was almost playing to survive. So. Um, He's a massive talent, and I thought he was brilliant was in his first couple of years, 18, 19. And yeah, I'd love him to have a, you know, a good run at being fit now and see where he can get back to. Because when he's at his best, he's still got a skill set, skill set that, to be honest, that England haven't really cracked to the death, have they? Um, you know, someone who, who's got all the slowies, he's quick enough as it is. Um, and I think he's at 31 wickets in that first full blast season, which I'm fairly sure was either the joint most or the second most ever in a blast season. So and that was as a kid basically. So he's got so much to offer if he can, yeah. If if luck can stay on his side, he can stay fit. So um, no, because there is a vacancy there in the England side, isn't it? Hundred percent, hundred percent. Without Jofra, who I think yeah. everyone hoped yeah. would come back, uh, you know, Tamal might be the guy. He really might. But you would always want some backup for Tamal with the the injury issues that he's had. So yeah. there's a there's a vacancy there. That's going to be a, a well. He's so young. He's he is so young as well that. Um, that this interest it doesn't you know he's not just necessarily there to compete with you know Mills and, and Jordan let's say but mm. he, he he could well have you know all being well have ten you know ten fifteen years ahead of him in the game in, as a white ball bowler if not more if he can stay fit so um, I watched all like, not far off Ben Brown um, Ben Brown Pat Brown I watched um, I was at Radley to watch Benny Howell and actually at the Oval to watch Benny Howell tonight and he um, I remain convinced would be a fascinating option for England as a as that kind of thing, somebody bowls all manner of slower balls, offers something that they've never had before. I don't think in terms of just the pure breadth of variation that he's got, um, and he bats as well. And once again, would be another lovely story um, if um, if if that became an option. And before we go on to the one to watch, um, just to finish off on the England from three Test matches round the corner, George, you're on about back to backs. What's a win for Brendan McCullum? Is it as simple as you know runs on the board, or is he is the pressure straight on? You, you I, well, it, it shouldn't be. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he's just arrived. I, this doesn't feel like his squad yet or his team. So um, I think he's got to be any sensible judge. Surely would allow him a bit of time to to see what he's got, and then to make changes. So I, I think. Um, what is it, a four-year contract? I don't even think you start to uh, look at that sort of thing for a, for a year in, really. Uh, so, no, but that, that, England can absolutely win this series. Of course they can. I mean, they're, they're, they're better than the results have shown up to a point anyway, although they're, you know, they're obviously not the strongest side they've ever been. New Zealand are, are missing four players. Uh, four, sorry, four players who, who uh, were in the World Test Championship winning side, which is almost exactly a year ago. So, they're... It's, I see this as a, pretty much a 50-50 series. So it would be nice to see some uh, enjoyable cricket. I think we will see that. I think there are some worries about um, the fragility of the, of the batting still. But, um, yeah, I, I give McCullum a bit of chance to see what he's got and um, make a difference. I think it, I, I, I would worry long term that uh, the problems of English cricket require more than a charismatic leader to resolve so I think we've got to be a little bit um, sensible about what he can achieve but um, yeah I, that doesn't mean you go in uh, ready to um, dismiss him if they if they lose this game in, in three days and Nick what have you got this week are you you know blast 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 or yeah, I'm going to the physio tomorrow match on your right <laughs> as well. try and get hey, put back together fixing the hamstring <laughs> um, come on Harvey how do you fix it um, no um I will. It's a good question, to be honest. Don't really know. Um, I'll, I'll probably, as 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 it is with the blast and the evening start times, I'll probably make a decision fairly late on and find myself somewhere. Um, but I watch a lot, lot of Test cricket and and have my leg raised. With, I, in fact, I put frozen peas on it last night. Didn't realise that the bag was open, so poured frozen peas gradually all over my sofa. It took about half an hour before realising that they were there. So it's all going really well. <laughs> And let's get on to the one to watch. England player watch. Right, gentlemen, George, Nick, 
one to watch in the blast have you got somebody that you think from the start this is my man Matt Potts was my man in the in the four day championship Will Smead is my man in the T20 blast he started quite well I wanted a young player that shapes up well um, I was going there was I was toying with two Jacob is a Beth Bethel at Warwickshire who I think I watched the under 19s and I thought this kid this kid's got something but I thought Will Smead's just a little bit I think ahead of him um, and batting on that lovely wicket at Taunton I'm going to be watching for him George well those are good choices um, I'm going to say as I would do for all things now Tom Lamanby I think if I could buy shares in the current young player he'd be the one he's got everything i know that the the, the scores aren't necessarily there but he, his, his bowling's pretty good his fielding's crazy good and i think his batting yeah <laughs> yeah right um I, mean, I think he's been opening the bowling for somerset hasn't he and, and actually um I, he's i think he's batting five which is an area of great responsibility it's almost an impossible area uh, in, in T20 cricket. I, I love that. So I think he is, um, oh, I think he's a special talent. Actually, am I right in thinking it, it, might he be with the same agency as you, Harmy? Do, do you know him? Have you seen him play? Yeah, I think he is. I think he is with um, Phoenix, with Neil Fairbrother's lot. I don't really know him. I think Michael Lung probably looks after him more than, than sort of Neil Fairbrother. But again, another one. I think we've got an abundance of talent in white ball cricket who are under 25. Mm -hmm. He can stick a pin in any of them and think, right, if we can invest some money in them um, and give them a chance, they've got a bright future, especially going into the game that's being played at this minute in time with the players that are playing. He was involved in a very good relay catch last night as well, actually. I don't know if you've seen that one. It was yeah. ridiculous. <laughs> they weren't even close. <laughs> that's as far as I can throw it these yeah. days, Nick. <laughs> um, my one... If I have to move from Ed Pollock, Woods, which, who ironically is, you know, entirely suited to this form, I will go with Joe Cracknell, at Middlesex, who, um, slight bias, I've grown up playing with him and his brothers, but he smokes it and was, uh, was picked up by London Spirit last year, midway through the hundreds, basically on Morgan's rec on Owen Morgan's recommendation, which I think is a pretty good advert for any young player. Um, he. He's a gun fielder and he hits the ball very hard. And he, he, um, he's got the fearless approach of of all young English white ball batters these days. He just goes out there and values hitting the ball for six a bit more than he values his wicket. And um, and you know he's very much about strike rate. His, I think his second scoring shot in professional cricket hit made a dent in the wall just beneath Old Father Time at Lords, um, pulling Jamie Overton about. 100 metres so he's got form for it and yeah um, give him the big build up so probably so better go alright <laughs> he started alright he has started alright that's the ones to watch um, Nick George thanks for your company this evening enjoy Lords George enjoy cheers whichever game and recover well Nick and <laughs> cheers, you know, fingers crossed <laughs> Brendan McCollum gets off to a fantastic start with the England side along with Ben Stokes um, and we'll be back next week talking about, hopefully, an England victory. <laughs>